Welcome to this video on the casts of the Infernal Exalted from the tabletop role-playing game, Exalted. The Yozis, the defeated primordials who submitted to the Exalted, have had millennia to contemplate their defeat in the Great War. Their general conclusion is that if they had exalts of their own, they could have staved off defeat from the gods' hands. Yet only their brother, Autothot, knows how to craft new exaltations. Still, the defeated primordials could corrupt what he had made. So they conspired with their never-born cousins in the underworld to steal the trapped solar exaltations in the Sidereal's Jade Prison. Their price for teaching the Death Lords how to corrupt them with Abyssal Essence was 50 exaltations, no more and no less. Why the Yozis were content to allow the Death Lords the lion's share is a mystery. Perhaps they only need 50 to complete their plans. 50 champions to open the doors to creation and set them free upon a broken world that the Yozis would reconquer and finally enslave for eternity. But, without further ado, the casts of the Infernal Exalted. The Slayer Cast Of the Dawn Cast, the Yozis remember that they were the generals, champions, and strategists of the Exalted armies that brought them low. When creating the Green Sun Princes, the defeated Primordials, particularly Malpheus, he who had been king saw much in them that could be improved by stripping away such trivialities as honor, restraint, and mercy, leaving an all-consuming desire for domination. Imbued with the desires of Malpheus, the Slayer caste was born. Though few in number, the Slayers are masters of war and slaughter. Where the Dawn caste are chosen from great warriors, the Slayer exaltations are programmed to seek out traitors, war criminals, and murderers men and women who are as unscrupulous in achieving victory as they are pitiless once they've obtained it. Slayers who adhere to the Malpheus urge crave destruction for the simple sake of destroying, for which the commands of their masters is simply the justification. Those with a Cecilian urge master violence so that they may assert their supremacy over all they encounter. Slayers of the Pyrian and Adojani urges use their strength to sweep away any who stand between them and what they desire or beat their opponents into submission. And the Ophidian Slayers view violence as just another tool to a greater end. But the Slayers are all marked by their patron in exaltation, Malpheus, with a pair of cross brass swords on their foreheads. Like the Dawn Cast, the Slayers can expend essence to terrify their opponents. Except, it isn't an illusion. Slayers actually physically transform into demonic beasts of war which can drive even brave mortals to flee. Not that fleeing would help. It would only mean that you would die tired. The Malefactor Cast. Of the Zenith Cast, the Yozis remember them as the priest kings and evangelists of their faithless servant, the Unconquered Son, who broke the loyalty of some of the primordial slave races to their creators and convinced them to join in the God's Rebellion. Cecilene, the Endless Desert, who once sought to make the laws of creation just and fair, took the prized exaltations of the lawgivers for her own, remaking the Zenith caste into the Malefactors, the speakers and judges of Hell's blasphemous laws. Cecilene no longer cares for fairness or righteousness, and her chosen likewise extolled the law that the Solars hammered into and cut into the defeated Yozis. Might makes right. The goddess of the endless desert reprogrammed her exaltations to seek out those whose ambitions are as endless as her scope, who will use the power she gives them to fulfill their desires and teach others that the only sin that will be punished in the new creation is weakness. Malefactors possessed of a Malfian urge seek to build a world of endless conflict where only the strongest rule or survive. Those who have a Pyrian urge seek to create perfect order where the mighty and the wise rule and the weak obey without question or hesitation. The Adrajani malefactors view fanaticism and demagoguery as the ultimate tools of rulership, seeking to transform the people into perfect servitors of hell. And those with the Ophidian urge believe only their desires matter, and therefore it is their right to do as they please, to whom they please. Malefactors are marked by an hourglass containing silver sands on their brows and are surrounded by sandstorms of green and silver to symbolize their patroness, Cecilene. As the priests of the Yozis, the malefactors may sacrifice a single sentient being to the true gods and desecrate the site of the ritual. Thereafter, demons are easier to summon at that place, 
but also binding rituals and holy charms are more difficult to perform there. As servants of the true gods, the malefactors may cloak themselves in essence that protects them against attacks by the usurper gods and their exalted, as well as enhance their own attacks against the same. The Defiler Cast Of the Twilight Cast, the Yozis remember their sorceries and the weapons they brought to bear against their true rulers, wiping out entire armies of loyal races. It was the Twilights who were the most interested in remaking creation to suit their rule. They were of great interest to the imprisoned Yozi, she who lives in her name, a primordial who once counseled against permitting free will to any created being, god or mortal. She of the perfected hierarchy made the Twilight cast exaltations stolen by the Yozis hers, turning them into the Defilers. She who lives in her name demands no more of the Defilers than their solar counterparts, to build, to create, and to innovate. Only these wonders and weapons are to be turned towards a new creation, one where the very concept of defiance is erased. The exaltations of the Defiler caste seek out the broken, both physically and mentally, who crave to be made whole, those who have been rejected by the world, and for whom every failure or setback is the fault of someone else, denied by a world too ignorant to see their brilliance. To be sure, the Defilers are as brilliant as their Twilight counterparts, but the Infernal's intellects are completely untethered by morality or ethics. This time, they will remake the world, and the consequences for those who live upon it be damned. Malfian defilers crave revenge, to destroy those who have frustrated them in the past, or stand in their path in the present. They believe that for the new creation to be made, the old one must be torn down to its foundations. Pyrian and Cecilian defilers regard themselves as visionaries, the chosen few who will free creation from chaos, though the former will set their own ambitions aside for the sake of the perfect order, while the latter believe that the perfect order must serve their own ambitions. Those with an Adrajani urge are mad geniuses, creators of strange and horrifying artifacts, and seemingly harmless tools that are actually weapons of mass destruction, along with spells that can leave populations permanently maimed or mad, but still alive. The defilers with an Ophidian urge are as hypocritical as they are deranged, seeking to purge society of the temptations and vices that they themselves indulge in. She who lives in her name grants her beloved chosen her own sign, a third eye in the middle of their foreheads that emits green flames. Defilers are further blessed with the protection of their patroness. They may expend essence to wrap themselves in an impenetrable globe, similar to one of the 99,997 that surround she who lives in her name. The Scourge Cast Of the Night Cast, the Yozis remember arrows and daggers in the dark, champions of the sun who hunted when their lord's eye was turned from creation. What hypocrites the gods are. But still, if the traitors can create such weapons, why should the Yozis not put them to use? Adrajan, the Silent Wind, adopted these dark children as her own. The Yozi patrons have some metaphysical concept that unites their components and gives them purpose. Adrajan's desires are protean, and she expects similar changeability in the scourges that she gathers to herself. Or, to put it another way, the Silent Wind wants her Green Sun Princess to be as mad and unpredictable as she is. Even before receiving the Infernal Exaltation, Scourge cast candidates have no fear of death. Many are psychotic, others are sociopathic, but all possess some level of cunning and duplicity. Few Scourges adhere to the urges of Malpheus, but those who do are quiet purveyors of destruction, particularly of those who try to make peace, usually doing their damage behind the mad rampages of anarchist terrorists and brigands. Cecilinian scourges are more quiet destroyers, taking power behind the scenes and eliminating their opponents without witnesses. The Pyrian scourges are compelled to destroy all whose thoughts or expressions might offend Adrajan and scourges with Ophidian urges are driven to eliminate those who try to restrain them from their taboo delights. Adrajan's mark is simple and similar to the night cast from which the scourges are taken, a red circle that slowly rotates, similar to Adrajan's eternal journey through the demon city. Also similar to the night cast is their ability to conceal their animal banners from witnesses. They can also create a zone of perfect silence around themselves, However, this effect cannot interfere with sorcery, necromancy, or charms that either create or require sound. 
The Fiend Cast. Of the Eclipse cast, the Yozis remember that they, more than any of the other treacherous servants of the gods, unified the Primordial's enemies into a cohesive and ultimately successful force. Such champions of order particularly offend the sensibilities of the being who was once known as the Shadow of All Things, but was imprisoned as the Ebon Dragon, who delighted in the idea of breaking and inverting the Eclipse exaltations. The Fiend cast, like their patron, seek to transgress every boundary and sow chaos wherever they go. As the servants of the Ebon Dragon, the architect of the Yozi's inevitable escape from the Demon City and ultimate triumph over creation, the Fiends claim that they are the foremost among the Green Sun Princes, whether or not their fellows agree to their leadership. Fiends are taken from those who regard society as theirs to manipulate, to set allies and friends against each other, to destroy families, cities, and nations with lies and poisonous half-truths. The Ebon Dragon prefers those who, like himself, regard morality as a social construct, a fetter to bind lesser creatures in service to their betters. The fiends respect no such restraint upon themselves and will use whatever weapons or tools they have at hand to get what they want. Malfian fiends delight in exposing the fragile nature of peace, destroying the weak and guiding the strong to fight against each other in flaming wars and slaughters against those who cannot resist the strong. Fiends with a Cecilinian urge slip into existing structures of power to tear them apart from within, marching through institutions while burning their rivals to ashes along the way. Pyrians prefer to turn the wheels of bureaucracy against those who would use them for benevolent ends, turning do-gooders into outcasts. Adrajani fiends prefer to make their wars more personal, getting close to their victims and tearing apart their lives one brick at a time. And predictably, fiends who follow the Ophidian urges of the Ebon Dragon reflect their patrons' disdain for morality and seek to introduce transgressions and explosive contradictions into society until it collapses into an orgy of depravity and ideological disputes. The slaves of the Ebon Dragon bear his sign, a disc on their brow so black it seems to swallow all concentration hope and resistance in those who look upon it, a window into the boundless malignance of the Ebon Dragon. Because the fiends stand outside of fate and destiny, they must bind their oaths in the names of the Yozis, the makers of creation. More concerningly, however, they can remove the burdens of oaths sanctified by their Eclipse and Moonshadow counterparts, temporarily freeing them from the consequences of breaking those oaths. So long as the fiend commits essence on behalf of the Oathbreaker, they are protected from the sanction of the gods and the Neverborn. However, this shielding only functions on oaths sanctified by a being of less refined essence than the fiend using the power, and they certainly cannot use this ability on oaths sworn to the Yozis. Lastly, the fiends, like their solar and abyssal fellows, can learn the charms of other exalts and spirits. However, they cannot use holy charms. And those were the casts of the Infernal Exalted. The Infernals were teased in the first edition and given a full write-up in the second edition. I never ran an Infernals game per se, though I made use of Akuma several times in my Exalted game. In particular, a solar who escaped the usurpation by pledging herself to she who lives in her name and occasionally took time out of her busy schedule to bully the walker in darkness when permitted by her Yozy mistress. Needless to say, she absolutely wrecked the shit out of my player's burgeoning army of mortals. As for the Infernals themselves, they make sense, but they are kind of weird to play. Basically, the Infernals have to be not just evil, but almost snidely whiplash James Bond villain levels of evil, because their urges demand it. Or do they? As I mentioned before, the Primordials may have corrupted the exaltations of the Green Sun Princes, but they themselves do not have a complete understanding of how the exaltations function. Another reason I did Infernals last is because the exaltations react, strangely, to Primordial Essences. To illustrate, Abyssal and Alchemical Exalted are, potentially, immortal. Whether this longevity is by design or a side effect of exposure to the Primordial Essences is left up to your chronicle. However, the Yozis modified the Infernal Exaltation so that they do not live anywhere near as long as any other Exalt. Like McDonald's and Walmart, they would rather deal with high turnover 
than let any of their slaves get too knowledgeable or get ideas in their heads that they deserve better. Yet the exaltation is a weapon, the greatest danger of which is its ability to combine essence, will, and possibility into a single being. By giving their slaves solar exaltations along with their own essences, they have created a potential future where the green sun princes become the devil tigers, self-made, unbroken primordials who will subjugate the Yozis and then claim creation in their own right, or perhaps even weave worlds of their own into being. Anyway, that's all I have for now. Until next time.